On the 9th of July 2001, Richard Branson unveiled his newest creation, the Class 390 Pendolino, the soon-to-be flagship of Virgin Trains' West Coast fleet, as well as the UK's first successful tilting train. In this three-part series about the 390 Pendolino, I'll talk through the history of the 390, its construction and operations thus far. In today's episode, I will look at the specifications of this groundbreaking intercity unit, from its modern interior to its impressive safety case, and the reliability Virgin designed from the 390s. Do make sure you subscribe so you don't miss these subsequent episodes. Anyway, let's go back to the very beginning of the Pendolino in episode 1 of The Class 390 Pendolino, A History. Virgin Trains took over the newly privatised Intercity West Coast franchise in March 1997, and with this inherited an ageing fleet of Class 43s, Class 47s, Class 86s, Class 87s and Class 90 locomotives, with 30-year-old Mark II and 20-year-old Mark III coaches. This stock was not only old, averaging 30 years of age, but also not at all what was expected to be operated on the West Coast mainline highly regarded as being one of the most important and busiest mainlines in the whole of Europe. Richard Branson, owner of the Virgin Trains Group and founder of the Virgin brand, was keen to change this, promising in the Virgin West Coast franchise to reduce Manchester to Euston journey times to just 1 hour 50 by running trains at 140 miles an hour, achieving this in partnership with Railtrack, who would make vast upgrades to the West Coast mainline. Virgin first set about to abolish this tired and decrepit fleet, replacing it with something a bit more modern. Virgin's aims were to reduce journey times and increase service frequency, nothing out of the ordinary there. However, as with anything Branson does, he wanted it to be different and record-breaking in some fashion. And what better way to do this than attempt to bring back tilting trains to the UK, something that went disastrously wrong the last time it was attempted. In the early 1960s, British Rail were determined to prove that Britain was still at the forefront of rail innovation, and thus set about creating their very own tilting train. The whole point of a tilting train was to counteract the sideways forces by 100% when going around a corner, without having to have a hugely banked corner, allowing for up to 50% higher speeds. In Derby, the concept was proven a success by British Rail engineers, who tested an experimental carriage along a test track. The Advanced Passenger Train E was such a success, running over 23,000 miles and becoming the UK's fastest train at the time, that British Rail announced that they would develop a further prototype, which would have the ability to take fair paying passengers. BR managers were beginning to be put under pressure by stakeholders, as eight years had gone by without anything to show for it. Therefore, the full, unfinished Advanced Passenger Train, APT, underwent a test run from Glasgow to London in harsh winter conditions. Although merely a test, high amounts of media coverage falsely suggested that this was the launch of the unit. When the test service was cancelled early at Crewe due to supposed weather risks, although it was later discovered that the unit did have severe issues that forced it to be cancelled early, an already publicity damaged British Rail were damaged even further, not helped by reports that the unit's tilt made people feel sick. The supposed Great White Hope was not meant to be. Margaret Thatcher was highly critical of the nationalised railway system and pulled funding for the APT project, meaning the unit was forced to be put into service to try and generate funding for further development. The train was quickly pulled from service due to more terrible PR and queasy ridership. The tilt was just too good, and despite a fix for the tilt queasiness, in 1985 the advanced passenger train and all hopes of a tilting train in Britain were quietly retired. Flash forward to 1997 again, where Branson now wanted to bring back tilting trains, which could significantly decrease journey times along the West Coast mainline. Instead of turning to British-based manufacturers though, Virgin turned to the European mainland, where manufacturers had indeed created a successful tilting train. Branson tested several tilting trains in Italy, but picked Alstom's Pendolino line of trains to be used, persuading Angel Trains, one of the original Roscoe rolling stock companies, to fund a £600 million fleet of 53 Pendolino units. On November 17, 1998, the British Pendolino design was unveiled by Virgin to the public and later classified as the Class 390 on the TOPS identification system. As well as this, Virgin pushed Railtrack to sign a £2 billion deal for the upgrade of the West Coast mainline, to allow for 140 mile an hour operation by upgrading the track signalling and electrification systems. So, 
The order was in place, the units were on their way, but what was different about these Pendolino units? And, more importantly, how would they break the stereotype of tilting trains the UK perceived them to be? Firstly, the technical side of things. These new units, the Class 390s, were to have an off-the-shelf tilting system, which would ensure the failure of the advanced passenger train would not happen again, and passengers would not be able to feel sick. Virgin opted for electric actuation tilting instead of hydraulic tilting to ease maintenance. The big change compared with the APT was the fact that the tilt would no longer compensate the curves by tilting 100%. Instead, they would compensate tilt just 75% for the sharper curves, with a lower 8 degrees tilt, giving the Pendolinos a smooth, gentle curving sensation at high speeds, and shallower tilting at low speeds. One problem encountered with the tilt was the loading gauge. In Europe, where all the other Pendolino models were operating, the gauge was much wider and allowed the trains to tilt at will without risk of striking a passing train or structures such as bridges. Virgin desired a tilt-at-will system for use on the West Coast mainline, but with tight headways and gauging, the option was quickly ruled out by the safety authorities. The default position for tilt would be set to tilt-locked, with certain sections being tilt-enabled. The authorities also added a speed supervision system to ensure overspeeding into corners would not be able to happen. Virgin responded to these safety additions with the implementation of TAS, Tilt Authorization and Speed Supervision System. Designed by Alstom, it would work by a unit departing its terminus station with tilt enabled, but would await a final command before being able to tilt. The train would then pass over a tilt transponder on the track, which would be located after Primrose Hill Tunnel for Euston departures. This transponder would give authorization to the Pendolino for tilting and would supervise the speed. This authorization would be updated by subsequent transponders, which would be located every two or so miles. Where tilt would not be enabled, the train would pass over a D-tilt transponder, with the train detilting in just seven seconds. If the train failed to find a transponder, it would automatically disenable the tilt, with this only being undone after passing two subsequent tilt-cleared transponders. The train would also need to be able to exceed line speed for some curves, when TAS enabled with tilt. The train would automatically reduce its speed to the cleared line speed, if unable to find a subsequent transponder, similar to the TAS tilt aforementioned. The Pendolinos would be fitted with safety systems to ensure drivers would not be able to overspeed, doing this by warning them when travelling at 3 miles an hour over the limit. Then at 6 miles an hour, the train would reduce their speeds automatically to at least 20 miles an hour below the permitted line speed, before control would be given back to the drivers. The units would also be capable of delivering 5.1 megawatts at the rails, which would be almost double the previous Class 86 and 87 locomotives, which could achieve 2.5 megawatts at 110 miles an hour. 12 traction motors would be enabled, distributing power to maximise adhesion in acceleration and deceleration. The tractive effort would also remain continuously constant until reaching 125 miles an hour, with the acceleration being a vast improvement to the previous loco haul trains. The 390s would achieve 0 to 60 miles an hour in just 55 seconds, reaching 125 miles an hour in just 200. The trains would also be planned with associated cab signalling (ERTMS), which would allow the units to reach the 140 mile hour speeds Virgin envisioned. Another impressive feature of the 390s, and a UK first, was the implementation of regenerative braking on an AC train, which the 390s would use whilst braking. This would be environmentally friendly. By recycling the current across the national grid, this would mean that appliances could potentially be partially powered by a Pendolino in your household. The trains would switch from regenerative to rheostatic braking in under a second if the overhead lines are not receptive of the current or whilst in neutral sections. Traditional friction disc braking would still be the default on Pendolinos though. The train's interior would be just as impressive, modern and sleek as its exterior with every seat having an electronic reservation display, which could be updated instantly from the train manager's computer. A central reservation system would also allow for seat bookings to be made up 30 minutes before departure, being possible due to Virgin's creation of the middleware system, VMS. For 2001, this would all be highly impressive, regardless of how common it is today. The VMS would mean turnaround times could be significantly reduced when compared to Virgin's previous rolling stock, Gone would be the days of staff having to manually apply paper reservation slips to every seat, meaning turnaround times could be minimised and more trains could be used at a higher frequency. Displays would also be fitted to the exterior doors and in the interior bulkhead, 
allowing for real-time GPS information systems to be displayed, such as the next station stop and calculated arrival times. At the time, the Pendolinos would also be the first intercity UK train to have CCTV in every coach, operating continuously regardless of whether the train was on or not. Radio was also very popular at the time. This was before mobile phones and streaming services, so every seat on the train would be fitted with an onboard audio system, where users could plug in their own headphones beside their seat and listen to up to 14 Virgin radio stations. Inside standard class, each seat would be fitted with reading lights, plug sockets for laptops, albeit at tables only, and window blinds. In first class, Virgin decked the cabin out in a soothing blue palette, with table lamps and service points for crew members during busier periods. First class would also be home to the onboard kitchen, fitted with fully stainless steel equipment, ovens, grills and hobs would be installed, with a full refrigeration system and ice machine also installed. Virgin wanted to provide the ultimate first class accommodation, rivalling the most premium of airlines. The vestibules would also be decked out in silver with a blue tone, and were made to look highly futuristic, almost like a spacecraft, and would also feature a public telephone. The exterior doors would open providing a step to help passengers on and off the train, and the doors would seal to provide a pressurised environment such as on aircraft. As we enter the 21st century, more thought was given towards those with disabilities travelling by train. Thus, there were disabled seating positions adjacent to disabled toilets in standard and first class, welcoming the same amenities as any other seat and a flap-down tabletop for ease of access. Priority seats were also installed nearest the doors, so those who would struggle with movement or might need some more space could grab a seat with ease. The Pendolinos did come with buffets named The Shop. They would be installed to fit a third of a coach and would allow customers to browse food and drink items as well as other items such as CDs, magazines and headphones before paying at the counter. Probably the most important thing, and something that will be mentioned later in this series, is the safety case for the Pendolinos. To enter service, the train would have to meet very strict European regulation requirements, mostly due to the fact that they had new features, such as TAS, but also because of its tilting capabilities. When Virgin presented the Pendolino to Network Rail's regional safety panels, they had to present to three different panels, due to, at the time, the West Coast Mainline running through three separate Network Rail regions. Virgin used three independent safety advisors, as well as a huge number of consultants, they had direct interface with the Department for Transport Inspectors, and many more network rail acceptance bodies. The Class 390 gained its full safety case for 110 mile an hour passenger running in July 2002. They were very nearly ready to start service. All this high-tech tilting, innovative systems and luxurious interior sounds good, but if the units weren't reliable, then there would be no value for all this technology. In 2003, the miles per casualty, MPC, of Virgin's older fleet were averaging at around 6,500. However, Alston guaranteed the Class 390s would reach over 50,000 MPC by 2005, with a planned introduction being 2003. This would give Alston two years to deliver on its promise. The Pendolino's distributed traction equipment and degraded modes of operation would allow the units to rescue themselves from failure, as long as overhead wires were present. Having two pantographs on one unit would also allow there to be a failure in one pantograph, with the other rising and being able to provide the same level of service. Each half of the train would have its own traction motors and air conditioning units, with any problems displaying on the driver's VMS computer screen. Virgin would also use test tracks at Old Dolby in Derbyshire, where they hoped a combined 450,000 miles of test running would be enough to ensure failures in service would be kept to a minimum. Whether this happened, though, we'll have to wait for the later episodes. So, in today's episode, we've looked at the history of Tilt in Britain, why Virgin subsequently chose Tilt, and the specifications of their new tilting trains. But, how were they manufactured? What if the units failed mid-running? How did initial services run? How did Virgin combat increased need for capacity? And how were the crews trained? All of these questions, and more, will be answered in the next episode. Then, in the final episode... We'll look at the service patterns of the 390s, what they were supposed to operate, and how they operate today. We'll look at their incredible body shells, and how this saved hundreds of lives at the Grey Rig disaster, and how the 390s have fared since their introduction, all the way into the 2020s, under Avanti West Coast, and their future under a potential new nationalised operator. Anyway, a huge thanks for watching today's video. Do consider subscribing if you have enjoyed. 
Also, special thanks to my first class members, Callum Martin Bell, Crispin McKee, and random username 2040, as well as my business zone members, Andrew Bowen, Anthony Harris, Anthony James Moore, ARK, Connor Grieg, Craig Mitchell 43, Gordon Walker, J Tecco, Lewis C21, and NJTE. Get your name on this list from as little as £2.99 a month and help me to make my videos. I really do appreciate it, so thank you. Also, thanks to everyone that's let me use their footage for today's video. You can find their channels in the description or pinned comment. Thanks ever so much for watching. Check out my Twitter, Discord and Instagram in the links below. And I'll see you soon. Goodbye.